and we are going to explore artificial intelligence in music. We, we're going to focus artificial intelligence and music. Our discussion is going to look at the area of composition and how it's evolved over time. We're going to touch a little bit on performance, what it means to perform using artificial intelligence that has generated music and then actually uh, what artificial intelligence can do with music these days. And, and uh, you know, there's been quite an evolution since the 1950s. And then I've got, I've got some, if we have time, you know, we can really start talking about the future artificial intelligence. But uh, at this point, it'd be very nice if, if I, I, I just delved straight in. This is, an, uh, this is a timeline of artificial intelligence in music. And on this timeline, we can see that, you know, we, we have our first case in 1957. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time of our discussion this morning just going over those those first developments, what technologies did they use and what did the music sound like when we, we start exploring artificial intelligence in music? Now, you know, as with AI, we know it's had a few winters over the last, you know, uh, 70 years, but uh, in, in the, it also happened in music where, you know, all right, that's been done, that's novel, that's great, it's been done and then, you know, people did similar things, right? But we come to the 1990s, and I think that this is a very interesting time for artificial intelligence because, you know, uh, we have the first generating music systems. Before the 1990s, you know, you'd have to deal with either live or recorded music, and with that, you'd have a beginning and an end. And people wanted to know, how do I make the music go on and on and on? <laughs> so that's when the self-generating music came in. And Brian Eno, who's actually a very famous composer for many other areas of music, from film to experimental, he actually um, uh, started this, this, uh, uh, the developments on self-generative music. Then, of course, enter the early um, 2000, 2010. Well, actually, David Cope with the Experimental Music Intelligence Project that actually started many years before, but it didn't really gain traction until this particular period of time when he developed um, a, a music intelligence called Emily Howell. And we're going to listen to exactly what things sounded like, you know, a good 10 to 15 years ago when we had that first... Um, that first particular uh, attempt to listen to music, give it feedback on our emotional responses to music, and then have it compose. And then, of course, we come to 2019, and there was an amazing breakthrough that we're going to look at today. And I think that I've got a trusty assistant here, Hugo. <laughs> Thank you, Hugo, for joining. And he's going to help me with the laptop sharing and sound. And we're actually going to make a composition together with artificial intelligence. We can do that. We've got the technology for it. And um, I hope that, you know, some of the people that will help us in this experiment are not musically trained because that's where the technology is now. We have the ability to generate and compose music and we don't necessarily need all of those, all of those uh, years of technical training to be able to produce something. But of course, there's a lot of discussion on, you know, is that really composing? Now, at the end of this particular presentation on exploring AI music, I take a look at something radical that happened this year. That, so this is, we're just at the beginning of how artificial intelligence can, can really do something with music. And this is called the AI Brainwave Opera. It was premiered in Tallinn in February 2020, just before we had our COVID lockdown. And it was, um, I guess you could say, designed and, and created by Ellen Perlman and a, a crew of many other people. And it is the world's first emotionally intelligent, artificially intelligent brainwave opera. And this is really taking people's brainwaves in real time and feeding it into an operatic performance that is being constructed by the audience. Artificial intelligence can now, now do that. People can now be really part of the composition and performance, even though they are the audience. I think that's pretty cool. Of course, we'll finalise our, our little chat with a, 
a thought on what could be the future of artificial intelligence in music. Will it be using the CRISPR platform, which is changing medicine at the moment, for auditory aug augmentation? Will we have auditory cloaking devices and acoustic metamaterials to silence noise in our cities? You know, these are just some of the future thoughts about where sound is going and what artificial intelligence can do with sound and music. So I want to take a, a, a trip back in time and we're going to start back in 1957. And the, this is the, we're going to take a look at the very first piece of music that was actually constructed with a computer. And uh, what was interesting about this, it, it actually happened in, in the States, the University of Illinois, and they have this, uh, they had this major big, well, I guess you could say it was called the Iliac One, <laughs> and it was a computer. And what happened is these, these professors came together and they said, what happens if we get a computer to generate music based on algorithms and binary programming? Binary programming is using, for example, zeros and ones, yes and no. And uh, they, they developed uh, four, I guess you could say, four experiments that are played on a string quartet. They used the Monte Carlo method for random data sampling to train their, their Iliac computer to understand certain rules of composition. I'll show you those rules soon. The first one to two movements, perhaps a third, are based on traditional composition framework, you know, um, having a, a certain pitch rule or a certain duration rule. But then what happens when a computer generates music using algorithms and computational techniques not based on music theory? And that's when we hear these later, later um, experiments. So the fourth movement is actually generated using Markov chain music. If we were to take a snapshot of the structure of this particular Iliac suite, we see, um, oh, there's no mouse pointer. We see actually experiment one, we have certain parts of it which are, you know, uh, based on musical principles. We've got the experiment two, you've got cadences. Um, you know, these are really typical and, and they sound like they are rule generated music, something that could, I guess you could say, come from Bach. But then, you know, as the experiment progressed, you can see that, all right, now we have some random chromatic music and we're going to listen to that in, in, in the string quartet in a moment. And then, of course, we, we have the fourth experiment and I urge you to just look it up and listen for yourself where they actually hear, you can, you can actually hear that this is what happens when a computer generates music for the very first time in history, 1957. So... With that, all right, um, this is the, if I, you know, taking a snapshot, this is what it looks like when you, you have to figure out, all right, how do, you, how do you make some rules? You have to make a schematic and, and put these rules in a kind of prioritization. So, for example, do you want a tritone resolution? Tritone is la, la. It is a very, very unpitched, uncertain type of interval. And so you can say yes or no. Do you want to set a cadence that is a series of notes that come together and finish a piece or not finish a piece, but usually finish a piece? And you can set that yes or no. So this is our binary programming and we're giving it rules. And, it, you know, the composers came together and they said, right, if we have to design a framework, this is what it looks like here. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, we see uh, this is an example of a Monte Carlo generation um, uh, stimu but from the Athena Python libraries. And this is the kind of code, if we went to construct this piece now, this is the type of code that we would actually put through our laptops. So I can share it, it's okay, we can, it's all up there. There's a nice reference down there where I pulled it from. And this particular, this is just the beginning of the code, it's not the full piece. But this is actually what an algorithmic composition looks like at its core. It's a real algorithm, okay? So, what comes from that? Well, those algorithms and that structure, all those, all those pieces that you saw before, actually constructed these pieces of music here. Now, that looks like pretty standard music for a, for a, a musician. So, um, Hugo, can we hear the first 
um, the first sound on on this, the the sweet one, Iliac. You maybe can. <laughs> Start again. Okay, so that was uh, using a traditional music framework and, and uh, allowing uh, uh, the algorithms to produce that particular so piece of music. So this is the beginning of what we would call computer-assisted algorithmic composition. Now we're going to listen to a little bit some, something that defers and starts to depart from the rules of traditional music. Um, this is the third experiment from the Iliac Suite. Four go. Four by four. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So that's interesting. You can hear that it might sound, it might start sounding nice, but then it loses its its um, formation, and there's no rules being applied anymore. And that was the the state where where um, people were excited about this particular development in music, but at the same time, it was um, it was interesting. It, it was interesting. Now we're going to go on to um, another period of time. What we heard just now was made in the United States, but over in Paris, there was another particular composer who had a background in engineering and architecture, a, a Greek French composer called Ionis Xenakis. And uh, Xenakis, having this engineering background was, was uh, uh, no novice when it came to mathematics. In fact, he actually made a, he actually authored a book, uh, Formalized Music, which really explores how you can use mathematics in music for composition. So Xenakis was quite the pioneer when it came to uh, compu computer assisted algorithmic composition. And so in between 1958 to 1962, Xenakis teamed up with IBM in Paris using a 7090 computer. Now, um, I tried to, <laughs> tried to find a photo. This is one I grabbed off from Wikipedia. But this is the console of the IBM 7090 um, in 1960. And a, a typical system sold for about what you'd pay $20 million today or rented out for about half a million dollars today per month. So these were really expensive state-of-the-art machines that were used to, for example, guide rockets to the moon type of stuff. Um, of course, that was a little bit early at 1960. But at the same time, here's an Arcasis, and he said, let's do a collaboration. Let's see what this can, what can music come from a machine and how? And so here we have just a list of particular pieces from Xenarchus during his four years working with this IBM machine. And he used a very interesting type of structured process, a little similar to what you saw in the Iliac suite. So this is all happening around the same time back in the 1950s. If I'm to sum it up really quickly without going into the really technical aspects, Xenarchus, he would draw up a flowchart, some, something similar to what we saw with the Iliac suite. And, you know, that, that flowchart flow would define certain rules or in Xenarchus's case, probabilities. Um, of course, you'd have to define the meaning of things like the density of sounds in, for example, sequence A1. Then he would have to assign that particular sequence 
to the orchestra. And all of those orchestral instruments had their own little musical sequence that would be assigned to them. So you can see here, that's what that little picture is, where he's, you know, he's put a class together, he's put an instrument there, and then he's assigning, assigning them a little sequence. Then you have this attribution of pitch, glissando, you know, now you're getting into this really interesting way of drawing music and these schematics that he would do. Of course, you know, his stochastic music was rewritten in Fortran. So some of us that are more older here, we might understand of may have even done a little bit of Fortran programming. And then that last picture down there is the data. That's what, that's what the data is. And what does that do? Well, you know, we have uh, a, a, an output on the left-hand side, you can see that you've got the assignment of particular pitches with a particular class of instruments. And then you've got these durations that are assigned and dynamics. And Zanarkis would take this output and, and transfer that into a musical format. You can see that there's a musical format here on the right side. And um, this is how, well, this is a great example of what computer assisted algorithmic composition looks like. So, can we hear the first series of ST10, please? <laughs> Okay, so that's pretty exciting. I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know, it takes a lot of time to practice and pull something like that together um, in a rehearsal. I'll, I'll just say that it's very complex music to perform, but people perform it and they do a great job at, at, at this particular type of performance. But of course, Anarchus didn't want to stop there. Um, he said, all right, we can, we can now see that computer-assisted generated composition, algorithmic composition, it's got a basis. You can use computers to make compositions and be quite creative about it in the programming process. But let's take our step of creativity a step higher. Let's, let's, let's bring some humanistic elements into it. And in this respect, Xenarchus and, um, started composing with game theory. And I found that there are these, these compositions that he's well known for, um, one called Duel for two orchestras, and a much larger version and more extended version that we look at today called Strategy for two orchestras. And that's the, 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 the orchestral setup on stage here. You can see the two conductors with their two orchestras are standing back to back. And the idea is that this is a competition. There will be a winner. Um, now, the computer that, the, that we just saw, all of that, that process was used to generate the, the, the sound structures or the notes that the musicians would play. But now let's bring a little bit of human element into it, human performance element into it. When you're a conductor and you get this particular piece of music, let's hope you know a little bit about game theory. <laughs> very, very rare. Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. And uh, this is, as you can see on the right hand side, this is a matrix, matrix of the game. This is what the conductor will use to play the game. Each conductor will have this same matrix standing back to back and they have to make sounds. They have to make a, a competitive sound structure using this matrix. Okay, you see 19 rows by 19 columns. You know, you've got one conductor on the columns, one conductor on the rows. How do you play it? Well, when Xenarchus was alive, he was able to guide people in how to play this music. He was able to instruct them, all right, you do this, you do that. But then, you know, once, once people came around to play it, trying to play it, they'd be like, oh, my goodness, I don't have a mathematical background. It's, this is a very complex thing to try and make any music from. There's just numbers there. There's just symbols. How do you play a game like this? So what I hope to do today is very quickly walk you through how we make music from a matrix as a conductor. And um, first of all, Zanarkis himself realized that, all right, this is pretty tricky stuff. 
Um, <laughs> that's 19 by 19 matrix. That's complex. That's fine. That's the intention of the piece. But if you need something a little bit more simplified, there are alternative matrices that you can use to play the game. So that's what is on the right side of this particular presentation. But as we go down, he said, all right, let's let's try and and divide this up, this matrix up into various sound structures. So we have six fundamental tactics. That's the first six lines and the sorry, first six rows and the first six columns. And that makes the first square of our matrix there. Then we have a, a combination of these two tactics. So tactic one and tactic two will yield tactic um, seven. So that you, they start to combine the sound structures. And that makes the second part of the matrix. And then on the very ends, on the peripherals, we have um, simultaneous combination of three tactics or three sound structures. And um, that's, that's how you play it. Now, as a conductor, your way of trying to accumulate the most number of points means that you have to watch where you are on that matrix, but you also have to know where the other conductor is on the matrix. And you only can know that by listening. So you are actually listening to the other orchestra while you are conducting them, while you are conducting your own orchestra. And that is, that is unbelievably, trust me, that's the hardest thing as a conductor to do, listen to what someone else is doing and then conduct your own orchestra to give them the guidance that they need to play that complex music. And the conductors, they communicate where they are to their players by holding up cards. Um, or they could have a light board that would indicate to the players where they're meant to be in their music. And the players are jumping around based on how the conductors are playing this. Now I'm looking at the time, I'm just gonna quickly walk through, um, let's say we take this first um, row and first column, and we take this particular um, start of, well, it's, it would be the simple one. It's 106 for 116 points. And I, I guess most conductors would probably start here. The, you know, you're trained to start at the beginning. And uh, you'd have these two parts, it's the wind instruments playing in both orchestras. And so the, the conductor would toss a coin, who would begin, who would, um, that, who would begin? And who begins? There, there you go, there's your 116 points. Um, this is the score that each conductor has. They're slightly different. Conductor X has a very different score to conductor Y, even though they've got the same um, symbols on the music. And so that's what's playing when you see that 116, that, that particular point assignment in that matrix. These two, piece, two, these two sound structures played together. There's a lot of sound going on. I'm just going to skip down to where we will listen to this particular piece. Hugo, can we listen to strategy? <laughs> Two orchestras playing. percussive and the wind and the stringed instruments together, that means you're in the three sound structures, the, the more peripheral part of that matrix, trying to get points there. Okay. Um, I think it's time to move on and we're going to now have a quick um, look at Brian Eno's work on self-generating musical um, music. So I just want you to all think for a moment, where is a case that you would want us, that you would naturally hear music that plays over and over and over again? Do we have any examples of where we would maybe want or not want this music, but it happens anyway? Elevator. Elevator music. That's it. That's it. Okay. Elevator music, shopping music, um, airport music. <laughs> So these, these are the places that we just, um, that, that play music over and over again on a loop. But I want to take you back to the 1990s. And, you know, um, before we had software and the cloud that, that we, we typically use and practice our artificial intelligence on, we had these cassette recorders. And the cassette recorder would go for maybe half an hour and you'd be like jumping, oh, got to turn it over. And you'd press play again. 
all right, then we, we had CDs, and but you'd still come to the end of playing a CD and you'd have to hit play again. And that's, it. that's an example of music that is not generative. And uh, Brian Enner, what he did was he teamed up with this particular um, company in, uh, called Intermorphic and they developed what's called the Koan player software and it included a modular synthesizer and he says that this I have I have the works I have made with this system symbolized to me the beginning of a new music era there were once two alternatives this was live music and recorded music but now there are three generative music so in 2003 we hear Brian Enor giving a 96 hour musical event entitled Dark Symphony playing with the Cohen music can we hear the Dark Symphony? All right, thank you, Hugo. <laughs> what happens with the, the music that is on a loop and able to be generated with software. So now we're beginning to come into um, a technology where we're not just constrained by these huge large computers but now we're, we're getting software and, and now let's go to our next case where we have David Cope and the experimental music intelligence. Um, now this is quite interesting because the, the question is, can a computer really generate musical compositions that are good? So far, we've heard music that's pretty, pretty out there, that's uh, complex, um, not necessarily tonal, um, but certainly fitting into the avant-garde uh, era for classical music composition. But now the question is with, with this one, can computers really generate beautiful music? So the Experiments in Musical Intelligence, or EMI, it was originally developed to analyze these music structures, Bach, Beethoven, you know, the, the standard, they wanted to understand the structure of music and find patterns, little musical signatures. But what this ended up developing into is that this uh, particular EMI was able to replicate, based on its analysis, it was able to replicate new ways of making music. And it became not just a musical analysis tool, it became a, a kind of like a compositional tool. So um, this actually developed a little bit further into what was called the Emily Howell. It's not a person. This is a software, I guess. Well, it's, a, it's an interactive interface. And uh, it actually hears the feedback from listeners. Does that sound nice? Um, is this something that I want? And it builds its own musical compositions from a source database derived from its previous composition um, composing program. So now I want to I want to um, give you a listen to what Emily Howell has um, constructed in this from darkness to not to light, and I think that you will hear a very different type of music to what you've heard before. <laughs> A new change in music generation from um, this is now we're getting into musical intelligence and artificial intelligence and I found this particularly beautiful um, I don't know about anyone else here it was pretty amazing that uh, these this is just algorithms and and um, a little bit of human emotional input saying yes that sounds nice 
Um, but of course, it's much, much, much more complex in that. That's a culmination of a good 20 to 30 years of computer assisted algorithmic composition work and research. Now, when, when this, um, David Cope actually had a lot of controversy around his, this particular type of music because, let's face it, it's good, but this particular type of music has the potential to displace composers now because, you know, there's a, there's a human aspect that, that takes decisions with the, alongside the music, um, the, with, the, with the computer. And... You know, he had to he had to endure quite a lot of controversy and criticism. For example, in the United States, where they're very very open minded about experimental music, and you know, c computers and technology, he had he wanted to have artists play his music, really world caliber artists play the music, and he, he ran into this problem, where there would be agents that said, "No, guys, if you as a world famous artist play this type of music, that'll be it for your career." And so there was this, it started off this huge, huge uh, discussion. Hey, this is not composing. This is a computer generating music. Other, on the other hand, people would say this is years and years of research where a human has had a lot of input with the machine. So you have two sides of the spectrum here. Um, and, and we're still having that discussion very much today. Now, come to last year and a new thing happened until until about last year algorithms and music and artificial intelligence and writing up programs even understanding how to copy paste python libraries into your laptop you had to have a fair degree of technical background to be able to do that but OpenAI changed that with their MuseNet algorithm. And MuseNet is a deep neural network trained to predict subsequent notes in, for example, MIDI music files. What this means is that we all here now can compose a piece of music. Just a little bit of info for my data scientist friends here at Dyn. So the stats, where do we get the data from? The data is from what's called the Maestro data set. That stands for MIDI, Audio Edited, Synchronous Tracks and Organization. It's a data set of over 172 hours of virtuosic piano performances. And let's, I'll just, what it picks up and learns and trains in this particular algorithm is quite, uh, quite amazing. People, so audience people ruffling in their seats you know, um, you know, <clears throat> during the second movement of a slow piece of music, you know, you hear people go. <coughs> um, it picks up those those movements in the audience and actually brings that also into the um, potential clip that we might compose. So, you know, sounds were all collected here, but there are some limitations with OpenAI MuseNet that are still, you know, we're, we're, we're still on the cusp of AI and music. And that is that it doesn't understand where to start a piece and where to end a piece. So it's truly generative in that respect. It's a it doesn't know how do you play something that's beautiful? How do you introduce a concept to the audience and how do you finish it off so that people feel fulfilled and satisfied with what they've heard? Because actually we, we like that as human beings. We like to finish our pieces of music. If we don't, that sometimes we get that earworm where we get that jingle stuck inside our head. You know, they, they say, finish off the piece of music and the earworm will be um, managed. <laughs> so, of course, that's, that's um, a constraint in this particular technology that it doesn't understand how to start and how to finish. But then, of course, it is easy and it's free. So we're going we're gonna to have a go at trying. All right, um, you're only going to be able to hear what we what we come up with on this MuseNet, but you might want to try it yourself. Click on the openai.com MuseNet, and you'll scroll down to a particular um, a particular. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll come to a particular type of interface. I'm just going to go over to my colleague here. All right. Yep, and you're going to click the arrow, and. Can you play it from the start? So that is 
a combination of all right, what do we what happens when we put a little bit of Mozart's Rondo alla Turca with some Chopin? And so it's not a cold start. Um, you know, it, already the, um, the the particular interface has has got got Mozart ready to play and a little bit of Chopin in its data, and then it it, it stimulates a little bit of a, a, a segment. And then you can listen to it, and then it might generate another four of those segments, and you can listen to it, and you can choose which one to add on, and so forth. So it's using something that, you know, where, where it predicts um, based on what has been played before. And the shorter you make those predictions, the more control you have over this as a, as a, um, as a human using a machine to compose there's a lot of controversy around that. I'll let people enjoy, I'll enjoy and have fun with that, that particular toy. <laughs> um, do, do we think it's, uh, is that composing? I don't know. I think you'd have to take a look inside the mind of someone and, and see what parts of the brain are lighting up when you compose, what parts of the brain are lighting <clears throat> up when you play that particular, play with that particular tool. So only maybe the neuroscientists know. But speaking of neuroscientists, that brings us to our last example of artificial intelligence in, in, in music. And I want to talk today a little bit about Ellen Perlman's AI brain opera. It's the world's first emotionally intelligent artificial um, brainwave opera. It premiered in Tallinn in, in, in February this year. And it investigates the pl so opera always has to have a plot. You just can't make it up out of nowhere. You you know plots are absolutely key to anyone enjoying opera. Also, something that's important in opera that's part of the operatic experience is that you'll always have this um, perhaps a translation of what's being sung. You know, many operas are in Italian, and when you go to the opera theatres, they might have the subtitles being scrolled across. Um, that's it's very appreciated if you know if the opera's in German, you know, then you can understand it in your own local language. So, of course, what happens when, you know, opera, um, it, this particular opera investigates artificial intelligence and its effects on fascism and love. And so to do this, uh, Perlman actually goes into a, uh, and paces this opera on a relationship between Adolf Hitler and Eva von Braun. And so it's actually the, the libretto, the, the so let's say the talking like this, is taken from the events in von Braun's biography. <laughs> so there's, there's the text data going in, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to do any more libretto. <laughs> um, Perlman uses the opera to explore two questions. Can AI be fascist? Or oh, that's, a, that's a topic for today. And can our AI have epigenetic or inherited traumatic memory? And these questions raise issues pertaining to the potential future where humans and machines will one day merge consciousness. So this is really where we are in 2020, all right? So what you have to think of is people walking around and they've got these brainwave um, little, uh, what do you call it, EEG headsets on, and they're connected to a bodysuit. And the bodysuit is representing emotion with its lights. So it's a bodysuit with the lights. And um, the audience is, is there and they're able to really um, get involved. They're looking and they're, they're like, oh, wow. Um, they're, they're actually also watching the, the brainwave emotional states and the colours on the bodysuit. And so when it comes to artificial intelligence, this particular opera uses lots of different forms. It really combines text to speech, speech to text. It is using sentiment analysis and of course, also this biometric data. So there's a lot of different inputs going into constructing this opera and um, looking at some of the clips from um, the, well, I, I think we can only we can only hear now. I try to put video from you and sound from here at the same All time. All right, let's All try. Right. All right, we can try. All right, let's see if we can coordinate then. Yeah. All right, because that's something to really see, isn't it? What happens when people <laughs> construct an opera together? Just uh, bear with me a moment and I will. All right. Um, do I go to the beginning or? Let's go to 310. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to get there. I can't stand that if you like to think I'm a drinker. Yeah. Ready? 
Three. Almost there, yeah. Two. You have to count one, two, three, four. No. And the new lines to take on the drink curve. Of course, I've been wanting to ask you about my clothes. Does it hurt? a pretty powerful opera I would definitely have to say that it's um, something that is is uh, quite controversial but a controversial topic but also gets people discussing uh, what can AI do and and what can it not do and you know uh, that's the I thought that that was an incredibly creative um, display of using lots of different forms of artificial intelligence in this new type of music composition process. We're at a stage where we're able to use biometric data together with speech to text, text to speech, and sentiment analysis to really construct something where we don't have these roles of composer, performer, and audience, but we actually have a very blurred uh, musical experience going on where your audience are the composers and the performers. So I think that that's, that's where we're going with the state of artificial intelligence in music. Um, in the future, you know, we're going to, we're going to see some more developments on the, on the sound side, on, on what we can experience and the control over sound that we experience in our, whether it be in our environment or in our own heads. And, um, with that, um, I think that we now go to a performance. So we've been discussing today what really makes a composition particularly, um, uh, particularly creative. And I'd like to finish today's session with a little bit of a, uh, a particular performance um, using artificial intelligence not to construct the composition itself, but to act as a background and to make an environmental point. And I start this by using um, this uh, set of whale songs. Well, it was a hydrophone that was dropped into the Pacific Ocean and it was recorded for about a year uh, looking to detect whale songs. And these whale songs, uh, sometimes they're detected, of course, when you have a year worth of recording, how on the earth are you going to possibly find the whale in all of those recordings? Luckily, we've got um, a great example of, uh, this is, I, I would say, explainable AI. Um, in this particular, uh, yes, I've got my mouse here. This is great. You can see my mouse. You can see there's a spectrogram here and a spectrogram shows pitch over time. And so the higher the pitch, the higher up it is, the lower the pitch, the lower it is. And this is time, as you can see, on the x-axis. Now, the red here, what it shows is the confidence interval. How confident are we that we detect a whale? Let me just, um, can we just play a little bit of uh, the, it doesn't need to align up here. Um, it starts from there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so by itself, this is a scientific project. This is a great science. You know, we're looking for humpback whales in the ocean. This is a great way to be able to monitor them. 
listen to them. Um, the, the, so the red there and the different shades and grades of red show us a certain level of confidence in the detection of is that a whale or is it not? Is it something else? So, for example, over here it's 10% detected, whereas over here um, they're 100% sure that's a humpback whale in, in the pitch. But, of course, you know, th there's that's not enough. That's a, not a performance that we're all going to line up at the box office to hear. Not that, not that the next bit will be either. But um, <laughs> the, the point is we can use artificial intelligence as a form of, enhancing our creativity. Let's say I was to take one of my instruments, and I've got a few here, and I've got a, a just a, a normal violin. You can see it? It's a, it's a violin. It's, it's a violin, okay? There's nothing electric in this. This is made from wood more than 100 years ago. It's uh, my childhood violin. And um, you know, let's say I just wanted to play by myself and, and I, I was like, oh, I want to sound like a whale. And, and you know, you came to a concert hall. All right, that's, that's pretty uneventful in my opinion. You know, that's, you're all going to, 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 to probably, oh, yeah, all right, when does it finish? But when we combine technology as a prop behind a player, then we're, st we're changing the context of the artificial intelligence, we're changing the context of our sound. So what happens when I stand in front here and I go to play the same thing that you just heard, trying to mimic humpback whales on a violin, accompanied now by pattern radio songs. in the background. Now I can use different aspects of violin playing now. I'm going to go now into some experimental music where we don't just play what you heard was pretty conventional glissando on a violin, but we can use other parts of the violin. Or I can hit it. I can hit the violin with the wood on the bow. It's called collego. I can play behind the bridge. I can do lots of different things with a violin to change the context of a violin performance with the help of the whales. But I'm not going to finish there quite yet. No, we saved the best to last. Right? Yeah, that's a, we're still underwater. We're still with our whales. I come in and I bring in an oboe. And um, with the oboe, we can, we can, again, explore the oboe for making different sounds that might be with a whale in the background. And some of the experimental techniques that we can use to double our create, enhance our creativity with something like this playing in the background is pitch bends. So it's an unstable pitch. The, the whales are making an unstable pitch. So let's see what happens when we destabilize the pitch. What happens when you hear key clicks? It's kind of like you're underwater. The fish are on the reef nibbling. Um, you can perhaps make a seagull sound. Um, 
All right, so I'm going to play around with these different techniques for playing. I'm just going to stand next to the microphone for playing the oboe with our whales again. is a performance with humpback whales. Thank you, Hugo, for searching for those humpback whales for me with the radio pattern whale songs. And thank you for um, giving us your attention and watching today and joining us at Dine for our first open uh, content meeting. So thank you. That's the end for today. <laughs>